Here's this week's Steam Code Raffle winner. I give a Steam Code for a free game away with every video I do, and all you have to do to enter is leave a comment that wouldn't violate Twitter's terms of service. Make sure you have contact info in your YouTube profile so I can reach out to you. A complete list of games to choose from is in the description below. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a chance to win. Now on with the show! Hi folks, my name is Guillotine, and welcome to The Gaming Guillotine, where I extol the excellent and execute the poorly executed. And speaking of poorly executed- WHAT THE F*** DID I DO TO SPRING TO DESERVE THIS?! I don't know if it's just a matter of coincidence, or the concept of the vernal equinox triggers a galactic desire to see me entirely shit on. But if you've been paying attention to my community posts and upload schedule, you'll know that, while I'll be keeping my personal work and broadcast lives relatively separate, I have been dealing with a fair amount of, let's charitably describe it as, irritation. With that in mind, I've been slowly working back into normalcy, and part of that is selecting games to play, which I haven't had much time to do lately. However, there is one game that I've been wanting to talk about for a little while now, and I think focusing on something that I view in a positive light would be a healthy exercise. So, join me if you will, as I discuss one of my favorite narrative first-person shooters of all time. Released in 2010 for the Xbox 360 and PC, Metro 2033, developed by 4A Games, follows the story of Artyom, a survivor of the nuclear apocalypse. The story is based off the literary work of the same name authored by Dmitry Glukovsky. In it, Artyom and the rest of humanity as we know it have managed to survive total extinction by just happening to be in or near subway tunnels when nuclear war broke out. Just by that premise, one can establish that humanity is already in an immensely precarious and despondent situation. Survival on a daily basis, in and of itself, is an uncertain premise. Pockets of people now live in isolated settlements the size of whatever subway station they happen to be near, and to travel between them is often dangerous and reserved only for those that have the ability to defend themselves, or the ability to work or provide resources to ensure some may be able to protect them along the way. It's dark, it's bleak, it's depressing, and the first time I played it, it sucked me in straight away. For those that followed me for a little bit, you'll know that this is not the first time I've spoken of this game. To use what I briefly alluded to in those videos as a jumping off point to foster further discussion, the best element of Metro 2033 for most of the game is the atmosphere. Plenty of games are set in bleak worlds and have gone through various disasters and means of apocalypse, but rarely do they ever feel as authentic or still lived in as the Metro games. Let's take Fallout 3 as possibly the easiest point of comparison. I'll acknowledge that comparing the two may not be as favorable because they're trying to do different things, but that may make an even better illustration of the point. Fallout 3 is fairly bland looking, and certain areas of the game, while interesting to explore and featuring plenty of detail, they don't necessarily feel like a place where someone lives. It gives me a sensation similar to that of a stage play. A set or a backdrop made to facilitate the story that is meant to play out in front of you, and has approximate facsimiles of things that you would expect to see in daily life, but upon looking at them you start to notice details or sometimes a lack therein that would lead one to interpret a more complete sense of authenticity. Metro 2033, on the other hand, puts an impressive amount of effort into the small details. The NPCs that occupy the world are all engaging in tasks that make the area feel alive living spaces being given small things like photographs and other creature comforts that can go as far as expressing personality of the individuals that live there. 4A games put what I would argue is a Herculean amount of effort into realizing an environment for a player to easily immerse themselves in, and if you may indulge me, I'm going to split off on a tangent here. As I said a few paragraphs ago, Metro 2033 The Game is based off the book of the same name, written by Dmitry Glukovsky. Now in my experience, video games branching up from other media have two kinds of relationships. One is a game being created in order to boost the brand recognition of another piece of media or a franchise. This would be something akin to your typical movie tie-in that the gaming industry doesn't seem to make too much of anymore. Something that can easily be put into some other already established gaming genre, fill the basic needs of a contract, and then be kicked out the door to basically serve as a glorified commercial. The other is when a game is made because the source material inspires someone to such a degree that they feel they could make something impressive out of it. For this, I think of things like The Witcher, the Tom Clancy series, or indeed the Metro series. Back in the day, the game left such a profound impact on me that I decided to go and check out the source material books. At the time of writing, I've played all the Metro games and I'm currently in the final book of the Metro series. 
theories. I'm planning a more thorough video and dissertation of this theory, but it is my belief that after having read the books and seen a few other examples, Russian and Eastern European literature may show that their cultures in general have a significant advantage when trying to portray atmospheric detail. I'll be doing more research on this, but I may not be alone in this sentiment. Here is something of a similar nature from a Racevic video covering Metro Exodus that, while it's not going so far as to say that this may be a cultural lens, the attention to detail does not go unnoticed by others. But that's not the point. The point is to give designers atmosphere before they fill it with content. The philosophy being, if I can't feel atmosphere, it's useless. Meaning. As I said, I'm formulating an entire video just analyzing this theory through the lens of as many Russian and Eastern European games as I can get my hands on, and if you would be interested in such a dissection, please let me know in the comments. For now, let's save that for another day and get back to Metro 2033. The game itself starts with the typical first-person shooter tutorial section. Move, interact, shoot, and begin the setup of the story. In this case, we begin in medias res, with Artyom making his way to a tower in furtherance of some goal to destroy an invasive race that is theoretically endangering the remaining pockets of people nearby. In the ensuing combat, we see the degree with which humanity has fallen. Radiation has caused numerous species to mutate and usurp our position at the top of the food chain. After being driven into a scenario where you don't think you'll survive, the game rewinds a few days prior. Here, we find ourselves in exhibition station, Artyom's home, but all is not well. The station is being besieged by mysterious alien creatures called the Dark Ones who are seemingly launching psychological warfare on the inhabitants of the station with vivid hallucinations while rabid mutants attack from the tunnels. After barely repelling the attack, a grizzled veteran named Hunter charges Artyom with delivering a message and mobilizing defensive forces if he does not succeed on his next task. Obviously, we can take an educated guess on what happens in order to facilitate the game to continue. Hunter fails and Artyom, a man who has never wandered from the station where he lives, must now traverse a perilous, unknown, and likely impossible trail in order to try and save what few people are scrounging together a meager but hopeful existence. Now, Artyom just happens to be a silent protagonist for most of the game, but goes out of his way to relay his thoughts and intentions on loading screens. This is how we learn that he has no familiarity or barely any clue on what he's doing when he steps out on his adventure. I go out of my way to draw attention to this in defense of the game from one of the more prominent criticisms that I've heard other people making. You see, while there are stretches where he finds himself exploring on his own, I would argue that some of the most impactful story elements and sequences take place while he is accompanied. Now, some have stated that these segments of the game are irritating and damaging to the pacing, but I would argue that they are essential as characterization for the notion of role-playing as Artyom. You see, he's established as a new and ignorant explorer, and it makes sense that he would be relying on the advice and accompaniment of more traveled and experienced people in order to increase his likelihood of success. And as counterintuitive as it may initially sound, I found some of the most unnerving and startling events I've experienced so far to have taken place when I was effectively the subject of an escort mission, with the veteran I was tailing giving me directions in order to ensure my survival. And given how much I've gushed about the environmental detail and how much it immerses me, you can imagine the mood that it set me in once they started introducing supernatural aspects. In both the book and the game, it is alluded to that because of the immense disaster that has befallen humanity, supposedly now things that cannot be easily explained happen with a fair degree of regularity. In the book, it is theorized that when humanity destroyed the world, they destroyed the connection to the afterlife, so all the remaining human souls are cursed to forever be trapped in the subway tunnels and pipes that now surround them. If you'll indulge me once more, I'd actually like to read a brief passage from the book that sticks with me to this day. Bourbon continued quietly. Suddenly he stopped and turned his head to the left so sharply that Artyom could hear how his vertebrae cracked and he looked Artyom straight in the eye. Artyom started and stepped backwards, groping for his machine gun just in case. Bourbon looked at it with eyes wide open, but his pupils were contracted into two tiny dots even though in the pitch darkness of the tunnel they should have been thrown open to their limits in an attempt to capture as much light as possible. His face seemed unnaturally peaceful. Not one muscle was tense and there was even a contemptuous smile which had just disappeared from his lips. I've died, Bourbon said. There is no more of me. And as straight as a cross tie, he fell face down. Now, this particular segment I just read doesn't actually take place in the game, but serves as a strong inspiration for a few elements that you do come across. And, without going into spoiler territory just yet, that runs pretty consistently throughout the first book and the game. Taking the role of inspiration instead of being the template by which the game tried to run adherently to, which probably works to its benefit. 
Side note, in addition to my usual game giveaway, I have an extra copy of the first book available for anyone that wants it. No strings attached. As always, just make sure you have contact info on your YouTube profile, and if you would specifically like the book in addition to a game, have the word book somewhere in your comment. During Artyom's journey, he has to overcome various combative factions including everyone's favorite group to murder, Nazis. Between them, various bandit groups, and other pockets of humanity that are simply looking out for themselves at the cost of whoever manages to wander across them, the game facilitates plenty of combat encounters. Mechanically, Metro 2033 handles just fine. It's a typical mix of stealth mechanics and first-person shooting that offers a certain degree of flexibility in your playstyle. Unfortunately, it's not as flexible as I would like because it features a malformed kind of stealth where the second you're detected, everyone on the map knows exactly where you are. This does cause moments of irritation, but also facilitated a great degree of caution that I thought worked well in the portrayal of character and story. You look for every advantage in an environment before taking a fight and try to pick off isolated stragglers with throwing knives or silenced weapons. There's also another element which I thought made for an incredibly compelling means of gameplay trade-off. In the Metro universe, bullets are the primary currency. And I'm not talking about just standard ammo. Any normal ammunition that you pick up is of a mediocre to poor quality and has inconsistent damage. However, military-grade currency cartridges consistently deal high damage and are far more reliable, and it makes sense that in a universe where everything is so desperately trying to kill you, the most useful commodity you could come across is ammunition. It's such a shame this mechanic got dropped in later entries in the series. Planning out your resources and trying to anticipate the hazard you're going to be coming across, but at the expense of firepower in general. But I digress. The enemies you face, though, aren't just other people in the tunnels. Every so often, the story takes you up to the surface, and if you thought things were fucked down below, even much more so above. The land is plastered in nuclear winter, and while a lot less claustrophobic, the atmosphere can still be just as tense above ground. The mission that takes place at the Grand Library is of a particular note, with the monsters called librarians introducing a great deal of tension, and certain elements of the environmental interactivity going further to make me feel like I'm really immersed in this world. Actually, that reminds me of some small but subtle touches that I can't help but applaud. In an effort to get the player to really feel drawn into the world and environment, several visual details and interactive options have been included. Most of the player's HUD elements are actually incorporated into the character, such as your visibility being measured with a watch on your wrist. That watch is also used to assist you when you're wandering on the surface and have to utilize timed gas masks in order to wander around without choking to death. Objective markers also aren't present in the game. Instead, Artyom can pull out an adventurer's clipboard equipped with a compass in order to assist when directions become obscure. The flashlight you can equip in order to increase visibility doesn't work off theoretically infinite power supplies and batteries like in other shooters. Instead, you have a miniature electric generator that you can use to recharge it for small windows of time, and when the light dies down, you have to pull it out and recharge it manually. If you don't feel inclined to use that means to illuminate your surroundings, you have a lighter that can do a similar job and can even be utilized to clear cobwebs on the path that you may be walking if you're an arachnophobe like me. There's even a function to wipe off the lens on your gas mask when you start to accumulate gore and splatter after some of the more harrowing fights. Many of these tiny details may not be quote-unquote necessary, but it sets a tone and atmosphere that I find delightfully rich and appropriately oppressive. It's just a shame that the later portions of the game move away from this effort on immersion and start moving towards an emphasis on combat and action. And in an ultimate folly, the final level is summarized as a first-person shooter platforming segment. Speaking of the final level, let's go into some light spoiler territory. Skip to the following timestamp on screen if you don't want to see it. Artyom reaches his destination and utilizes old military stockpiles to destroy the Dark Ones. It's learned, though, that the Dark Ones were never actually a malicious entity, but were simply trying to communicate and their psychic visions were an attempt to reach out. What I didn't realize, though, and what I'm sure many people didn't realize until it was later told to them, was that Metro 2033 had alternate endings depending on moral choices that are made throughout the game when it's never clearly communicated to you that that's a possibility. In fact, some of the means of triggering the good ending are so obscure and nonsensical it bewilders me. Donating cartridges to the poor or refusing a donation from an impoverished family makes sense, but choosing to strum a guitar? Really? And the absolute final sequence is a confusing platforming corridor where I died more times than in any of the combat arenas put together. It's an incredible shame that the ending of the game feels so bogged down by this, at least in my experience, because most of the game leading up to it was fantastic. It could just be me, but it gives the impression of a game where it wasn't just the player, but the dev team making a mad dash towards the finish. It also does a double disservice to the title because the ending is what most people are going to be prominently remembering after they immediately finish. Most of the game shows off a degree of polish and attention to detail that many far larger studios seem to fail to grasp, not including a couple bugs I had on this particular playthrough, though. 
I was genuinely having fun when I made a friend with the dancing mole rat in one of the first combat arenas. Minor shortcomings aside, I still contend that Metro 2033 holds up and is a fantastic shooting experience and first book, both of which you should definitely check out. And on a final note, thanks for being patient with me these last couple weeks. I'm happy to be back. Hey, look at that, it's the end of the video. Don't forget to subscribe and remember that commenting can actually win you a free prize. So until next time, this is a guillotine saying thanks for watching and keep your head on your shoulders.